and I get ready. Okay, fantastic. Good morning, friends and colleagues, sisters and brothers in the fight for health equity and social justice. I'm Ngozi Arandu, Senior Scholar at the O'Neill Institute and the Technical Director for the Global Institute for Disease Elimination. I'm also the co-chair of this commission, and I welcome you all to launch the O'Neill Lancet Commission on Sh Racism and Structural Discrimination and Global Health. I want to thank the Ford Foundation, our host and our partner, for this beautiful room and I'm really excited to have everyone joining virtually, wherever you may be. I heard that over 1,000 people registered. Yay. So today, people have come from far and wide to start something new and to fight something that's not really new. To some, especially those who became much more aware of racism after the murder of George Floyd and the global movement for Black Lives Matter, it may not be too clear why the name of this commission sounds like it's addressing racism at the global level on one hand and at the structural level. Because firstly, isn't racism just about black and white people in the US and South Africa? And secondly, how can buildings be racist? Okay. I tried that joke earlier for three, on three people and it fell. So anyway, <laughs> moving on. Well, back in 2007, when I started my career at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, I remember hearing an allegory from the brilliant Kamara Jones. It really transformed the way that I looked at racism, and I think it may help us all get on the same page. Some of you may know it. It's called The Gardener's Tale. So there was a gardener who had two flower pots. In one pot, she filled it with rich and nutrient-dense soil. And in the other pot, she put rocky and weak soil in it. She has two types of flower seeds, one that produces red flowers and the other that produces pink flowers. But she prefers, flower, uh, she prefers red flowers over pink flowers. So she plants the red flower seeds in the flower box with the rich soil and the pink seeds in the flower box with the rocky soil. Of course, the red flowers thrive and they flourish. Even the weakest seed from the red flower batch, it grows and it becomes at least mid-level height. The pink flowers do terribly, of course. In the rocky soil, they, they are scrawny and they're weak, and even the strongest seed barely makes mid-height. Year after year, generation after generation, the flowers keep producing and continue to get similar results. Years later, the gardener looks at the two flower pots, the beautiful, strong, vibrant red flowers, and then the sparse, thin, and parched pink flowers. And she thinks this is evidence that she was right to begin with, that the red flowers are better. Now we all know that the gardener set up this system of inequality. She also never intervened to make things better. She never took soil from the red pot and put it into the pink pot. But really, that's the only thing she needed to do because if she started talking to the pink flowers saying, oh, you're as good as the red flowers, that wouldn't have changed anything. If she would have watered them more, it wouldn't have changed anything. The structural division of the flower boxes made it impossible for the pink seeds to access the good soil that they needed to thrive. Now, COVID-19 showed that existing racist and discriminatory, discriminatory structures of society is what led to large proportions of sickness and death in non-dominant group populations. Not only individual not only what we usually think of racism, which is individual physician, disrespect, and neglect. Blacks, Asian, and minority populations who had much lower access to quality health care before the pandemic died at much higher rights, rates from COVID-19 during the pandemic. Migrant workers who lived in overcrowded conditions before the pandemic had higher infection rates during the pandemic. Communities who lived in food deserts before the pandemic had a much harder time fighting the virus during the pandemic. And countries that did not have vaccine manufacturing facilities before the pandemic still suffer from low vaccine coverage. Structural racism is inherited disadvantages and it leads to differential access to goods, services, and opportunities of society by race, caste, or other inherent characteristics. This type of racism 
is, I'm sorry, this type of racism is institutionalized in our norms, our laws, and our customs. And it results in unequal access to material conditions, such as high quality education, access to clean water, and equal pay for equal work and other opportunities for progress. The O'Neill Institute is proud to host this commission. And we will build on our history of identifying global health solutions, including solutions for national health systems, by supporting the commissioners, the co-chairs, and the impacted communities. We'll help them to examine laws and policies and their structural mechanisms and other structural mechanisms upholding discrimination. The commission's leadership comes from someone I deeply respect and admire. And I'm honored to be working alongside her to lead this commission. And while she needs no introduction, I'm supposed to give an introduction. <laughs> Dr. Tlaleng Mofo King is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health and a distinguished lecturer at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. She is the medical director for the DISA Clinic, a women's health clinic in Johannesburg, and a senior lecturer in gender, culture, and HIV at the Africa Center for HIV AIDS. Oh, sorry, for the, for the Africa Center for HIV AIDS Management at Stellenbosch University. She is also a best-selling author of Dr. T, Guide to Sexual Health and Pleasure. She get the book. And she is the chair of our commission. Please join me in welcoming Dr. T. Thank you so much, Ngozi, for that um, opening of our launch event, uh, announcement of the commission. And um, thank you to all of you for being in the room. And as Ngozi has acknowledged, the many people who registered online, um, about 1,000 people. So thank you very much to all of you for taking the time to spend with us this morning. I want to start off by also acknowledging um, the fact that I stand here today as a person who embodies much of the prejudices and the discrimination uh, that racism and structural discrimination enables. And so a lot of my work, whether as a medical student, as a junior doctor back in the western mining towns of Johannesburg, or now as the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, is informed by that reality of being an eight-year-old living in apartheid South Africa who had to learn how to throw stones at a police armored vehicle. Nothing about that story is normal, and yet so much of it is normalized. And I am yet personally um, to deal with some of the trauma that is still underlying. Uh, many of us don't have memories of our childhoods, and it's often um, these kinds of stories that you know remind us why sometimes our brains would rather protect us from those memories. And so I bring that personal story um, to the work that I do every day, and I bring that as well to the work I do at O'Neill Institute as a distinguished lecturer, and definitely as the special rapporteur on the right to health. When I assumed my tenure um, during COVID, which was a very odd time to be appointed the special rapporteur on the right to health amidst the pandemic, I was very clear to the council that I will be taking an anti-racist, anti-coloniality frameworks to my analysis, but also very clear as well in my approach to using intersectionality in the true sense that Kimberly Crenshaw meant, not the gentrified version of intersectionality, to actually lead us to substantive equality. And I believe that with substantive equality, we can get the global health outcomes we so desire of non-discrimination, equality, and uh, systems of health protections that so many people desire. But in the context of racism, we know that a lot of people's dignity is eroded. My eight-year-old self's dignity was eroded, having to go through the things that I went through. And this commission, the work that supports the commission, will ultimately be in service of creating a life that's conducive for living in dignity. Yesterday, I presented a report to the General Assembly, which was my second report thematic to the uh, General Assembly, which focuses on the impact of racism on human dignity, life, non-discrimination, equality, and the right to control one's health and body, including the right to freedom from non-consensual medical treatment and experimentation. 
and the entitlement to a systems of health protection. And it's on the basis of those very anti-colonial, anti-racist frameworks that I wanted to expose the global health impact um, on racialized people who are still living under the legacy of racism, apartheid, and slavery, and coloniality, and many other oppressive structures and systems that racism enables. And this also, of course, includes uh, more broadly the economic global health architecture as well, and the funding mechanisms as well as, well as national health systems. It's important for me to talk about the global architecture, but also national health systems, because when you speak about racism, like Ngozi was saying, and now the joke has landed, <laughs> um, is that we often think of racism as something that affects individuals or communities that come from former colonized um, histories. And racism in, is transnational. Mm -hmm. Racism enables and supports a particular hierarchy in society that rewards certain behaviors and certain presentations in society, and in other, way, in other ways rewards um, particular uh, uh, behaviors as well. And that's why when you talk about racism, we talk often about heteronormativity, we talk about ableism, we talk about transphobia, we talk about um, the capitalist um, extractive ways in which that system itself is built, but also funds racism. And so with that context, we can see how racism permeates every aspect of our society and um, every aspect of our lives. Racism is a key determinant of health, um, also not just in terms of underlying determinants of health, which many people understand, safe water, nutrition, health environment, but also the commercial determinants of health are no longer an emerging concept, but it's one that often doesn't get the same attention. When we talk global health, when we talk public health, we often don't have the conversation about the activities and the impact of the private sector and their activities and how those impact on the right to health. And which is why um, with this commission we will also be focusing on the very important issues of you know, healthy working environments but also the rights of the workers in the, in, 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 in the workplace and thinking about a duty of care that employers have. Just to bring you in terms of the commission's goal, um, we want to reduce end racism but we understand that this three-year project cannot end racism. But what we do want to do is use targeted research and collaborations to foster policy dialogue within and across sectors that impact health and well-being. We want to engage with empirical research via partnerships, and some of our commissioners will themselves be uh, conducting empirical research. And as I said to the assembly yesterday, we do have a problem of data. Not only who data leaves behind, but also the fact that policymakers, legislators, health systems are not agile enough to actually change and modify and respond to what the data says. And one of the ways that we identify um, the work of the commission that it will be successful is if we can talk about and be very clear about the power shifts that need to happen in global health. As you have probably noticed, or maybe not, I haven't used the word decolonization. And that has been on purpose because decolonization requires us, all of us as individuals, to come with humility to this work that I often don't think is there. And this commission seeks to change that in not who leads the commission, but also who the commissioners are who themselves are people who are experiencing multiple compounding impacts of racism and structural discrimination on a daily basis, both personal and on a professional level. And it's that humility that we take up this work of the commission. I did say it's a three-year project, um, and one of the maybe four good goals that I can share with you is that we want to describe the current knowledge we know people have worked on racism. We are not the first. But we are the first to be convened in this manner. And we want to then talk about the effects of racism and the intersecting structural inequalities on health on a global context, but also the transnational context. 
Of course, we, we will be looking at existing research, like I said, um, through our commissioners. We aim to do site visits and focused visits. We will also have expert groups who support our work in the, in the mission of um, uh, looking and reviewing existing data, but also making particular comments about what data isn't there, who is being left behind, but ultimately who's being pushed behind. Because we know if there's no data, policymakers want data. And if there is no data, someone is missing, they will not find themselves in policy. They will not find themselves in budgetary considerations. And therefore, the law, the policy pushes people behind. We want to inspire new questions and new solutions about racism in health by also identifying new data. We want to also use this in our dissemination and communications plan um, with the aim of developing and sharing knowledge. A lot of what is also missing, I find, is that we don't have enough of knowledge sharing. Our commission seeks to be very open in its process and not only with the you know, ultimate uh, uh, outcome of a Lancet report, but we aim to take all the stakeholders with us along the way. We want to define and explore policies and activities that create power shifts um, that lead to more equitable outcomes. This is important for us to understand where power lies within ourselves as commissioners, as co-chair. Uh, we want this and we demand this of our partners as well who are part of the commission. And we demand a power shift and analysis of how power moves through the global health architecture on a regional level, national, and ultimately in communities with the aim of supporting and identifying um, the work that we know many communities are already doing. But because they don't have the power, their voices are often not heard. Their practices, their knowledge production is often minimized um, and demonized even if you think about African health systems or even indigenous health. And finally, we want to amplify our findings and recommendations absolutely um, with, the, with the global health um, world sector, our colleagues, and national policy spaces, which is really good for us. Um, of course, um, I am still the UN Special Rapporteur, and it gives me great uh, hope to know that even my own work during my tenure will find work, uh, expression and find life outside of the UN. I think I grew up as a child, I told you earlier on, in apartheid South Africa, but I was a teenager in a democratic South Africa. And so even my own relationship with international global health institutions shifts and changes through time. And power for me right now looks a particular way and I'm hoping to use the leverage that I have and the access that I have to ensure that ultimately we, we create a world and a society that is truly enabling and supportive of all people everywhere to live a life of dignity. And I hope you can join us um, and uh, you know support this work. And like I said, we are going to have a very open commission in terms of our process, and that you can all come along and um, support the ultimate uh, goal of ending racism, but absolutely um, restoration of dignity. Thank you so much. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. T, uh, for that powerful introduction and important framing for our three-year commission that we're so excited about. And I just wanted to say that over the coming months, we will be announcing the final commissioners. Um, but we are glad that some commissioners could make it today um, and very happy that our advisory members could come as well. So with all of that framing and understanding of why we need this commission and what this commission will do, we haven't really talked about why we need this commission now, right? Racism is not new. Racism has been with us for a very long time, including structural discriminating discrimination, including poor health outcomes for marginalized and minority um, populations. So why do we need this commission now? So to explain this to everyone, we have five colleagues that are going to give us their, um, give us their thoughts. I'm going to introduce each person before they speak, and I'll start with Professor David Williams. David Williams is the Florence Sprague Norman and Laura Smart Norman, Professor of Public Health and Chair of Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. He is also a professor of African and African American Studies and Sociology at, at Harvard University. Dr. Williams' research has enhanced our understanding of the complex ways in which socioeconomic status, race, stress, racism, health behavior, and religious involvement can affect health. Okay, Professor Williams. 
for your kind words of introduction. I think we need to address the problem of racism and its impacts on health now for three reasons. Reason number one is the racial ethnic differences in health is a global problem and the time has come for a global commitment to reduce these inequities in health. If I take the example of infant mortality, a baby dying before its birthday, in the United States, blacks and Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, Native Americans um, die at a higher rate than whites. In the United Kingdom, blacks and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis and Indians die at a higher rate uh, than whites. Um, in Latin America, across multiple countries, the Afro-descended population uh, have a higher rate of infant mortality than the non-Afro-descended population. We see a similar pattern across Latin America uh, for the indigenous population. And then if we look uh, in South Africa, blacks and coloreds and Indians have higher rates of infant mortality. If you look in Australia, the Aboriginal population have higher rates of infant mortality. So it's a global problem, and the time has come for a global commitment to new solutions. Number two, why we need to act now is what we have done so far has not worked. Let me give you an example from the United States where we had a civil rights movement and a war on poverty in the 1960s. Um, I looked at recent data on median household income uh, for the black population in the United States compared to whites. In 2018, African American households earned 59 cents for every dollar of income white households earned. Do you know what is striking about that 59 cents figure to the dollar? That is identical to the racial gap in income in 1978. You heard me correct. 1978, the peak year of the narrowing of the black-white gap as a result of the anti-poverty policies of the 60s and 70s and the war on poverty, the gap was reduced to 59 cents. And today, it is still 59 cents. We have been on a treadmill. There's a lot of talk and assumptions about making progress, but there's been little actual change. And we need a new commitment to do the things that will produce that change. And finally, why we need to act now, reason number three, these inequities in health that we are talking about are costly, are costly to individual societies, are costly to a global population. One source of the cost is the dramatic loss of life. In the United States context, racial inequities in health for the African American population means that 200 black people die prematurely every single day that wouldn't die if there weren't racial inequities in health. Imagine a fully loaded jumbo jet with 200 passengers and crew taken off from any of America's major airports and crashing every day and everybody on board dying, that's what we, it, we mean when we say there are racial inequities in health. In addition to the loss of life, there's also the economic cost, the enormous lost productivity in the most um, uh, m important area of life when people are making contributions to the economy. So we have to do something about these ongoing problems, and the time is now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Williams. Thank you so Thank much, you. Professor Williams. Um, indeed, we need a, need a new commitment to do things. Uh, we need a new commitment to do things to, to have actual change. So I'm, I'm leaving with that as, as well as the, the graphic image that you described, really. Our next speaker is Lois Pace. Lois Pace is the Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. In her current role, Ms. Pace is responsible for advancing the U.S. international health agenda through multilateral and bi bilateral forums. Reporting directly to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, she is the Office of Global Affairs lead on setting priorities and policies that promote American public health agencies and interests worldwide. Assistant Secretary Lois Pace. Thank you very much, Dr. Rundu, and I want to thank you and Dr. T both for bringing us here today. Um, it's it's truly um, an honor and privilege, and I and I 
really take to heart what Dr. T was saying about being a product um, of the prejudices that we face and that this commission is setting out to resolve, um, but also acknowledging that at least in my case, I'm also a product of privilege and holding both is going to be very important, at least for me, I know moving forward. Um, it's a conversation I think that we can have even more um, within our government and obviously uh, with all of you. Uh, before I make remarks, I also wanna acknowledge where I sit, I'm in Washington, DC, as has been said, but this is historically the land of the Nkotchtank, Anacostan and Piscataway people. And so I do want to acknowledge um, this uh, ancestral land and traditions and the peoples uh, who uh, historically have held this space uh, and to continue to hold this that space uh, for them uh, as we live and work um, where we where we sit. You know, this question of why we're here is important too, because as you said, Ngozi, you know, we've we've been here before um, and we know what the issues are. And I think if we're being honest, uh, it's important to really stop dancing around uh, disparities or determinants in other ways that we talk about these issues. And it's not to say that work has not been important to date. It's it's work that I've proudly done and, and collaborated on over the years, but it's not entirely working. And it's not working, obviously, when it comes to uh, COVID, for example, and the global response, but it, it hasn't been working, um, as has already been said by our our first speaker in this session, right? Uh, when we look at the rates of maternal mortality in the states, for example, um, when we look at cancer and HIV with certain groups or populations, and that's just here, uh, let alone what we're seeing around the world. So what are we gonna do um, to make things better and to truly improve on, um, on what we know uh, needs to advance in this space uh, and for people who are historically marginalized and left behind. Something our president did on day one actually was issue an executive order on advancing racial equity. Um, and that involved or included the health space but was not inclusive, exclusive, excuse me, uh, to health. But it was about not only looking at the outcomes um, but looking explicitly at the process and what we and our own government could do to dismantle these systems and structures in a way that hinders progress uh, for a number of different groups that are historically marginalized and underserved. Of course, we're looking primarily at uh, racial and ethnic groups, again, that have been left behind, and that includes Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Native persons. But it's not exclusive to those people either. And I think that's important um, because we talk a lot about the intersectionality um, when it comes to this work and the importance of looking at people who are affected by persistent poverty and inequality or people with disabilities or obviously gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer persons. And so I'm really encouraged by the work of this commission to unpack um, the range of issues that we need um, to address. And as we've all said, uh, not only look at individuals and communities, but look at the ecosystem that either helps or hurts them. I guess I'll, I'll finish my remarks by really talking about the ways we're trying to unpack this here. And again, this is not something I think people realize um, in this in the global health space, um, how, uh, how deep and thoughtful uh, I think we're trying to be here in the work that we do when we, we haven't gotten it right. Um, but we are we are doing what we can to check our own practices and uh, think about the degree to which we are complicit or continue to be complicit in racism and discrimination in the global health space. And regardless of one's intent to do better, it's really critical that we are honest about the impact that we have, especially if we talk about building back better. And so what I will share are, I suppose, some principles that we're trying to, to operate from. Um, in this space as we pursue our work. Um, obviously that involves promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility. It continues to be important that we prioritize local leadership, expertise, and knowledge that we elevate and respect local decision-making, but also that we practice this true collaboration and partnership um, with local experts and regional leaders in a way that is meaningful to them 
uh, that is driven and led by them. Um, we need to be fostering and, and facilitating independence and sustainability, again, of work, of strategies, of activities driven by communities, countries themselves with whom we want to work. And then ultimately, we, we need to, as Dr. T was saying, really acknowledge the legacy of racism, sexism, discrimination, and other ways that or actions that disempower um, uh, these um, partners with whom we've worked over time in, in really harmful ways. And, and in the end, our goal should be to do no harm. So again, we, we're, we're grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be a part of this work. And I wanna acknowledge again, the, the journey we're on, the path ahead and you know the fact that we will surely stumble along the way, but appreciate you all for creating the space for us to engage and um, continue to try and do right um, in the work that we do. Thanks. Thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Pace. Um, I'm really appreciative of your reflection on just how you can hold privilege and hold oppression as well, right? Like we all exist in these intersectional realities and I think it's important for us all to acknowledge that. Um, thank you. So our next speaker is Kumanan Rasanathan. He is the unit head for equity and health at the World Health Organization in Geneva. He's a public health physician and with 20 years of experience in health and related sectors, and previously worked in the area of health systems and maternal and child health for WHO Cambodia. Dr. Rasanathan. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Arundu and Dr. Tulaleng for invitation uh, to speak today. Uh, to answer the question, why now? I, I'm not sure I can answer it better uh, than uh, Dr. Tling's statement earlier and also her barnstorming presentation to the United Nations General As Assembly yesterday. Um, but I'll try and also, also really um, strongly agree with many of the statements already from our colleagues. Um, from our perspective, social injustice uh, continues to kill on a grand scale, driving persisting health inequities because of those gross inequities, of course, that we call often the social determinants, although that can seem as jargon. So at WHO, we've been reflecting on why haven't we made the progress we hope for after the clear prescription of another commission, the Commission of, on Social Determinants of Health, that WHO organized and released its findings in 2008. And it, it was quite clear. It said you had to increase, improve daily living conditions. You had to tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources, and you had to monitor the issue of inequity and uh, monitor the impact of solutions. And whilst there's been progress as we prepare to uh, release a, a new WHO report on this issue next year, and we've been doing the analysis, it's clear that in many places we haven't seen the progress we'd like, in many places we've stagnated, and in some places things have even got worse. And while, yes, uh, as I think uh, Assistant Secretary Pace alluded to, we, we, we do need to uh, improve housing or improve education or improve income, there's these underlying obstacles that perhaps we haven't named enough. And they are structural discrimination, including racism and gender inequality and, and the intersection with other discriminations, economic inequality, war and conflict and the commercial determinants of health. So we really do need to tackle those head on and, and that's not easy. We've seen the, the shocking inequities in infection, morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 and in the social and economic consequences of the pandemic. And they very much re reflect the structural discriminations in our society and the failings of our systems and governance to tackle those. Racism, of course, is an eternal issue which Many of us, or perhaps most of us here, have a personal experience of. It's also an issue that the health sector cannot tackle by itself. I think it's very important that we focus on racism within the health sector. But unless we tackle racism more broadly and, and the in intersection with other structural discriminations, uh, we will never be able to have equitable health care. And moreover, we certainly won't um, address health inequities. So, I'm so excited about this commission for many reasons, but I'd like to give three. 
Firstly, that it's taking a structural approach, uh, unashamedly. It's focusing on the intersection of these structural discriminations and the intersection of structural discrimination with economics and history. And as I think we've heard, I mean, interpersonal racism is so important. And again, just to respect the contributions of Professor Kamara Jones here, but perhaps interpersonal racism gets disproportionate focus compared to institutional racism or internalized racism or structural racism. And whilst it's important and encouraging that perhaps uh, we don't accept now the experiences in airports that many of us used to take for granted, or we ask, well, who's speaking on panels in elite spaces, or we really consider what is acceptable to express in the way that our institutions run and who's leading them, that's very important. But it's not either or, but it does pale a little bit in comparison to the things that Professor Williams was talking about. These wealth gaps that just haven't moved, that are rooted in historical and ongoing oppressions and discrimination. It pales in uh, comparison to the alienation of land and the destructions of the economic base that Indigenous peoples have suffered and continue to suffer. It pales in comparison to the oppressions that some communities face within countries just because of their religious or the ethnic identity. It pales in comparison to mass, mass incarceration. So it, it, it's really encouraging that the Commission will look at the structural focus and, and really also this acknowledgement that structural discrimination is universal. So yes, of course, uh, the Commission will look at the ongoing legacy of colonialism and look at racism in Europe and North America and Oceania, but I, I'm sure it'll also have the courage to look at structural discrimination all over the world. I mean, many of us know well that structural discrimination also occurs between peoples of colour. Secondly, I'm excited that the Commission will shine a lens onto the structural discrimination of global health itself. And I think this is timely and, and overdue. And whilst global health and its practice, and I know this well, reflects the power relations of the world, and perhaps the way global health is practiced isn't the most important aspect of structural discrimination in the world, global health, all our principles, our rhetoric, our constitutions are animated by equity and human rights. And so we should be leading on this rather than falling short. And where we fall short, we need to be called to account and we need to do something about it and do much more. So I'm sure the Commission will really help in this regard. And then and finally, I'm excited that the Commission is really going to focus on concrete solutions, policies and actions, because we know that structural discrimination cannot be solved by so-called awareness or diversity, equity and inclusion courses or even naming and shaming by itself. It requires struggle, social movements that dialogue, that humility that Dr. Talang talked about and willing partners, and it takes time and sustained commitment. So I'm looking forward to bold and flinching proposals on what we need to do, allied to insights on how these can be implemented in our current, sadly, very challenging political economy, because that's very much what we need. So I, I'm wishing uh, Dr. Talang and Arondu all the very best and to all the commissioners for this very important and, and challenging endeavor and looking forward to helping as I can. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Rasanathan. There was so much there. Um, I'm leaving with bold and unflinching proposals. Um, we definitely want to bring that and have that birthed from the commission. And last but not least, we have Dr. Richard Horton. Dr. Horton is the editor in chief of The Lancet. He is an honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the University College London and the University of Oslo. He now works to develop the idea of planetary health, the health of human civilizations and the ecosystems on which they depend. Dr. Horton. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ngozi. And first of all, let me just say it's great to be partnering once again with the O'Neill Institute. Our very first commission together was on the legal determinants of health, which we published in 2019, led by Larry Gostin and a great team from Georgetown. And it's also a privilege for us to be working once again with the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, this time 
uh, Dr. Moffateng. So thank you very much for the opportunity to renew these partnerships and uh, um, build something even more ambitious than in the past. Now, the question you posed is why this commission now? Um, so let me try and answer that from a specifically Lancet perspective. Um, although there were changes happening slowly in some domains, and as we've heard from Professor Williams, not in others, um, something quite seismic took place with the murder of George Floyd on May the 25th, 2020. The global, and it was a global shock of that televised brutal act of violence, triggered um, a really worldwide response. It was a dividing line, I think, in modern history. There was a recognition then, widespread recognition, that racism was embedded at the very core of Western societies and within their institutions. And the impact of this moment did not exclude uh, my world, our world of science, medicine, um, and global health. Our institutions slowly began to look at their own pasts and their current practices. The idea of decolonization moved more into the mainstream of curricula and policy. And racism as a determinant of health began to be taken more seriously. It's also fair to say that there has been a violent conservative backlash against this reappraisal of some of the most fundamental assumptions about the organization of our societies. So when Ngozi and the O'Neill team first approached us about the idea of this commission, we really immediately seized on the opportunity for such a partnership. Because if I take a parochial United Kingdom perspective for a moment, the truth is that the entire basis of modern medicine, public health, global health in my country is traceable to the trade in African slaves that my country exploited through the 16th to the 19th centuries. And it was the vast profits of the African slave trade that paid for, financed the industrial, scientific, and medical revolutions of the 19th century. That is a history that we have completely erased from our memory. We've written a mythic, Whiggish history of science and medicine that has papered over the reality of that past. And it's a history that we need to restore. We need to study it, we need to understand it, and we need to respond to it. We need to pay reparations to it. As Eric Williams wrote in his 1944 book, Capitalism and Slavery, that was recently republished as a Penguin Modern Classic, slavery was not born of racism, rather racism was a consequence of slavery. And if that is so, then the racism we see in our science society today has a direct historical line to that African slave trade. So this commission, I hope, will begin to explore some of these historical themes and their impact and meaning in the way we construct our institutions, our society today. Let me also mention that on December the 10th this year, Human Rights Day, the Lancet will be publishing a theme issue on racism, science, medicine, and global health. And this theme will be an important part of our 200th anniversary year next year, 2023. And this is why it's really important to us, because the Lancet was first published in 1823. And that means that the Lancet was founded as part of Britain's colonial movement. We were part of our colonial history. We were indeed founded as a colonial journal. And in many ways, Global Health Today has been reinvented as a neo-colonial enterprise. I wrote earlier this year about the myth of decolonization that it's too comfortable to think that we can decolonize our curricula, decolonize our institutions, decolonize our politics, because no sooner have we 
so-called decolonized one area of our life, it becomes recolonized by different power imbalances, different power inequities. Colonization is an ongoing project. It's taking place all the time. And as Kumanen said, it's not a struggle that ends, it's a struggle that needs to continue. So I hope that we can connect the past to the present to think about how we can take those analyses, those meanings, those interpretations to fashion a politics for the future. I very much welcome the launch of this commission and our partnership together. Um, I look forward to our future work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Horton. We're excited to partner with Lancet in this endeavor, um, and also really appreciative of the reflection of the Lancet um, and its complicity, its participation in coloniality. I think, like you said, uh, George Floyd murder, it really did expose kind of this dividing line and this truth that racism is, in, is embedded in so many existing institutions. So. Thank you to all the speakers. That was excellent. We look forward to, uh, you know, just, what's the word? <laughs> Being with you all, um, consulting you all, and uh, yeah, engaging you all throughout this commission. So thank you. All right, so the next portion of our time together will be a panel discussion on racism and health with a question and answer session. And before I introduce the moderator, I wanted to thank everyone. I forgot to do this earlier. Thank you all for, waiting a bit. We started a bit late, so especially the folks online, we really appreciate that you uh, waited for us. And the folks in the room, thank you so much for being here um, and waiting as well. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Derek M. Griffith. He is a founding co-director of the Racial Justice Institute and the founder and director of the Center for Men's Health Equity and a member of the Lombardi Com Comprehensive Cancer Center and professor of health management and policy and oncology. He is trained in psychology and public health, and Dr. Griffith's program on research focuses on developing strategies to achieve racial, ethnic, and gender equity in health. He specializes in interventions to promote black men's health and well-being, and interventions to address racism in organizations and to mitigate the effects of structural racism on health. And just to say that um, Dr. Griffith, the, the Racial Justice Institute that he uh, co-direct is at the Georgetown University. So please, Dr. Griffith, Griffith, thank you. So if I could invite my co-panelists up and I'll introduce them um, once they're here. Good morning and thank you again for this opportunity to be with you today. Um, it truly is a pleasure and a delight. Let me um, begin. My task today is really going to be threefold, just to make sure that, of course, I introduce the panelists, um, to get their reflections and thoughts about sort of where we're going and what we're doing, and then to field questions and organize questions as we go forward. So let me begin by uh, introducing our panelists. So closest to me to my left, we have Dr. Catherine Burns an Associate Professor of Medical History at the University of uh, Vitterstein in South Africa. Um, to, next to her is Atiyah Warth, the UN Independent Expert on Foreign Debt and Other International Financial Obligations. She's also the first female director of research and enterprise in the University of Nairobi. We've, of course, met Dr. T already. Um, and then last, certainly, but not least, Shamindra Rwadana. Did I do that right? Okay. Shamindra Wurwardana, um, a human rights activist with a strong intersectional focus, so definitely a writer, political, and international affairs analyst, academic, and educator. 
So we have quite a distinguished panel, so thank you all for joining us. So one of the things I wanted to start with is we've talked a lot and you've heard a lot about in the questions and the, and the, the prompts that we've seen in, in the panelists thus far, in the, the presentations thus far, and that is mostly focused on why and what has happened before. So actually, the first question I want to ask is, what is your vision for where we need to go? You have an order? I do not have an order, so I'm open to whichever, <laughs> however, who feels most inspired first? I'll keep it short. OK. <laughs> I've spoken already. But I think I want to say that to me that's the biggest, the most time was spent on that question. And within the composition of the commission, the commissioners um, that we reached out to partners in this process had to answer that very question. And for me, ultimately, it's about the restoration of people's dignity. And the inherentness of, of dignity means that we can't do any work without then stopping to ask the very people who are affected by these issues, what does dignity look like for them? Mm -hmm. And I think it speaks to what is currently missing in a lot of spaces where okay. there isn't really meaningful participation of people who are most impacted by any of the issues. And you know, experts, people in different um, you know, global health institutions set the agenda, send the targets, um, set the indicators, and the frustration I had as a medical doctor is that I was chasing data and indicators. I had no idea what they meant, where they fit, and they were completely opposite to the needs of the community that I'm seeing every single day. Mm -hmm. And so it's about that entire experience for me, but at the center of it is restoration of people's dignity. And you can't tell me what dignity looks like for me as a 40-year-old black woman from South Africa I need to determine that for myself. And so for every region of the world, every community in the world needs to determine for themselves what dignity looks like for them, what they are their most urgent needs. And I think for me, the vision is one of true freedom, free freedom to self-determine. Mm. Um, and it's a bit philosophical, but you know, in my last report to the council in June, you know, I ended that with a quote from Toni Morrison where she said the, the function of freedom is to free somebody else. Mm. And that is the commitment that I bring to this commission, is that I may have particular privileges on the one hand, have experiences and currently discriminations on the one, but I'm hoping that this hand can lead you know, um, all of us forward to true freedom, and that is a life of dignity and self-determination. Thank you. Mm. Well, I guess I can jump in. Please. So, so I tend to be the, the strange animal in the room <coughs> very often because my area of specialization is fiscal law and policy. And for the longest time ever, everyone thought I was a little bit crazy when I would talk about the fact that there needs to be a connection between the resources and the rights. And um, my tagline tends to be rights require resources and resources require rights. Sorry. <coughs> But um, I've been particularly struck because over the past um, almost 10 years of working around, almost dancing around uh, health financing issues, I see so many power dynamics at global levels, at regional levels. And then even down at community levels, there's power dynamics around uh, control of the resources, on the allocation of the resources. Um, there's been so many discussions around issues of uh, participatory budgeting. And there's one that specifically struck me because in, in Brazil, there was a, a decision by a community to spend money on putting pollution control on a private factory because of their quality of health and their quality of life. And when you speak to the members of parliament in those very same spaces, it would never have occurred to them to spend money in those spaces. So there you have this, this micro granular approach to what finance should look like. And then when you look at national levels and regional or continental levels, and then up into the global levels, you see the very same challenges are presenting themselves over and over again. And um, I was struck by the, the discussion on the history of the Lancet because 100 years ago, four economists decided to split the financing issue from the rights issue. And that's how we have the Universal Declaration. We now have the different uh, conventions. And 
a hundred years later, myself and a group of other special rapporteurs, we wrote a letter to the OECD as well as the, the G30, and we said, well, why are you not taking on a human rights approach in your fiscal spaces? And for me, this is, this is the problem, that we are, we've embedded and we've put into the structure, deliberately or accidentally, these separations between the two spaces. And now we're in this huge struggle to push them back together. Sometimes it feels like that pressure ball, right? That keeps pushing you, you back over and over again. And um, I like an Ethiopian proverb, in, at which point I will stop. Uh, there's a wonderful Ethiopian proverb that says that you only look down the well when the water's running dry. And sometimes I think a lot of these um, structural discriminations are, are bypassing us because the water's not yet run quite dry. But I think we're getting pretty close to the bottom. And I think it's, it's time to open up a lot of the spaces, both on the fiscal side as well as the health side, in trying to push the, the ball a bit closer. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. So before I, I take the next question, I think the only friendly amendment I would make to your comment is the water isn't run dry for certain people, but it definitely is run dry for, for others. Yes. Yes. But yes. Um, others? Thoughts? Does this work? Yeah. So yeah, um, from a, a perspective that I would like to bring to this table uh, comes from a commitment to um, decolonial human rights advocacy. So um, in many spaces uh, nowadays, uh, when you walk in to talk about uh, decolonial approaches, for example, to um, SOGS human rights advocacy, so uh, a body of human rights that concerns diverse uh, uh, sexual orientations, gender identities, expressions, and sex characteristics, or any other body of rights, um, and or indigenous justice issues um, in this part of the world, especially in Turtle Island, you do have um, you want what one can notice a certain shortfall in terms of how people construe what decolonial really is. It's very much, the, if you want to engage in meaningful decolonial advocacy, what it means is recentering, decentering power structures. And this commission um, is very much uh, an initiative that focuses on this objective. And at the same time, when you think in terms of feminist politics, this is something I really wanted to um, highlight. And when I was invited to be a commissioner uh, in this commission, uh, one uh, key motivation that uh, made me say yes was my commitment to uh, a certain brand of intersectional feminist advocacy in everything I do in, in terms of uh, knowledge production, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of human rights advocacy as well. Um, intersectional feminist perspectives, uh, when it comes to the provision of healthcare, when it comes to uh, meaningful human rights advocacy, uh, require a great deal of, um, I would say, commitment um, in, in, in terms of um, uh, delving into inequalities like structural and um, I would say systemic, that's the word I was looking for, systemic inequalities. So um, when you think of um, gynecology as a profession, for example, right, it's a, it's, it's a body of knowledge that was built originally on the oppression of black women, right? So uh, the, the, the historical legacies of this very, uh, you know, the, the, the racially discriminatory, uh, ra racial discrimination in the, in the medical profession, and also the intersections between racial and gender-based discrimination in the medical profession continue to persist. So when today, when we say uh, there is gynecological violence practiced on um, uh, women, seeking asylum or women from marginalized backgrounds on indigenous women uh, in the territories, uh, in the indigenous territories where I live in the northerly uh, parts of Turtle Island. Uh, there's this case of uh, uh, Miss Joyce Eshakan, 
who um, was an indigenous woman from the Kanawake Mohawk territories um, uh, known as Montreal, um, was subjected to uh, blatant discrimination in a, in a hospital. And the only exception, the only thing Joyce Eshakan did that other indigenous women who face these things on a daily basis, what they did not do, what she did was she live streamed it on Facebook, you know, before minutes before she passed away. So, I mean, this kind of discrimination have a long historical backdrop. So this commission um, is well pleased to delve into these realities and um, raise awareness on these um, on these matters and to explore ways in which. Uh, public policy, philanthropic funding, uh, and uh, and the uh, uh, explore ways in which the powers that be could be led in a progressive direction when it comes to healthcare provision. And so, um, this is the perspective in which I understand, uh, uh, for example, trans human rights, trans health. Um, the level of um, difficulty in terms of accessing quality health care uh, and uh, the challenges we face uh, in terms of many forms of backlash have very strong historical antecedents. So we need to, I mean, there is a, there is a body of work that needs to be done um, on, on, in terms of answering what does it mean to engage in decolonial feminist approaches to healthcare provisioning or what does it mean to engage in decolonial feminist approaches to um, uh, human rights advocacy. All of these things are interlinked. So um, exploring those linkages and exploring um, uh, ways of moving forward that are kind of at times that could even be counterintuitive. Uh, that is how I see the role you know, of, uh, of, of this commission and the work that lies ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, it's good for the historian to come last. And the baton is passed from each of your comments, which are so rich. Um, as many of you know, in the 17th century, a book uh, written in English moved around the world uh, very rapidly, particularly in West Africa, in the Caribbean, and in the Americas. And its name was Pilgrim's Progress. And it was an allegory strongly connected to the Judeo-Christian tradition. And its movement around the world, historians have shown, in multiple languages and versions, was actually on the back of the Atlantic slave trade and also the movement of people around the Indian Ocean. And the allegory in it was a story of a person who faces um, unbelievable, almost non-endurable challenges, but who overcomes them because of the uh, strong religious uh, relationship between that person and God, a monotheistic God. And the claim of that book is that every human soul is in that kind of adventure and that a good works and extreme hard labor and faith will overcome. So many human beings across the world, whether they are part of the Christian or Judaic traditions or other monotheistic religions or not, have been persuaded of that view of change, that this conversion is within the individual and that glory awaits in the afterlife. Well, one of the famous historians of the United Kingdom, also in the Eric Williams tradition referred to earlier, a Marxist historian of social history called Roy Porter and his then spouse, Dorothy, they wrote a very interesting book in the 1980s, which is not read very widely, unlike Pilgrim's Progress by Bunyan. It's called The Patience Progress. And it's about the history of the concept of a patient and how that word became coined in English from the Latin and has also become part of global language with the dominance also of the Anglo tradition. To be a patient is to be a supplicant. It is to wait, to be in the waiting room of history, to be waiting for the cure, waiting for the doctor to arrive, waiting in the queue. It's about 
um, abrogating your dignity or claiming a dignity that is very partial, the dignity of obedience and the dignity of uh, your power being handed over. Uh, a dramaturgy is expected in the waiting room. Your progress is dependent on another person's energy and on a system's energy towards you. And you have very little power in that encounter, whether as an individual or as a long community of people, of souls, for example, in Central Africa waiting for vaccines, which have not yet arrived, and so on. So for me, as a historian, your question is about the future. It's threefold. First of all, very, very difficult for people with enormous amounts of expertise which have come to them through hard labor to acknowledge the roots of their understanding of science and of biology and of human anatomy and of best evidence-based medicine, that the roots of this are contaminated, complex, and multi-layered and that power has to be shared, including power from knowledge that has been hard won. When I arrived at Johns Hopkins to study the history of medicine and began to ask questions about the history of medicine at that university in 1986 on a Fulbright scholarship, I was told that I had come with a struggle mentality from a country that was on the brink of massive change and that Johannesburg was not Baltimore and I needed to not bring those questions to that space. Johns Hopkins is in a very different space now, some 25 years later. And the questions from Nairobi and Johannesburg and New Delhi and uh, cities such as um, Sao Paulo need to be asked in New York and in Washington DC and in Baltimore and in Seattle. So there is a topsy-turvy set of questions happening on the global stage. And why youngsters in Nairobi and Johannesburg took up the cause of the murder of an individual that the whole world was electrified by is because they recognize the South in the North and they recognize the North in the South. So the first thing is this very difficult project of examining why certain forms of power knowledge have gained the ascendancy they have. Is it because of their brilliance, their prescience, their insight? Or is it for that plus other reasons? What is the prescience and the brilliance and the insight of the knowledge power that has come from struggle in other parts of the world? And so, in a way, the second part is not to be patient, to be impatient, to demand change to examine the agency that exists in people who have a certain kind of relationship to dominant discourses and to try and reconfigure um, forms of respect, which is where dignity is rooted. And then the final one, the one that I don't think anyone's mentioned yet, but correct me if I'm wrong, is to look for models in the world and evidence both empirical evidence and philosophical evidence of examples or exemplars where without a huge balance of power change, there has nevertheless been an extraordinary movement towards dignity and health achievement against the odds. There are examples in the Americas, the examples in this own city. There are examples in Johannesburg and Nairobi and Kolkata and New Delhi. There are examples in cities like Kiev. All over the world, in rural and urban areas, people have achieved benchmarks that would be considered outstanding in global health. Uh, dignified treatment, treatment that brings um, a, a conception of the whole health of the person. Uh, achievements in maternal health, achievements in the dignity of health of people who are sexual minorities, achievements in uh, the um, elongation of a healthy and good life in, for example, men in rural areas. We have practices around the world that have produced evidence trails. They have to be gathered. 
they have to be put on the table alongside of uh, best practice models that come from the global north. And we have to understand what was it in that particular spot in the world that allowed that form of knowledge to connect and produce an outcome. And those kinds of knowledge are shared more easily today than they were before because of the digital revolution. So it is not only the calamities that we are viewing, the death of people, the imminent death of people, which is captured and placed into live streaming, which galvanizes world attention. But it is also good practices that work that are being captured and shared by people on TikTok, on uh, Instagram, in forums all over the world. And this kind of a commission can, I think, galvanize that evidence, which was much harder to share in the world in the past when uh, journals such as The Lancet or their peers made it very, very difficult to share knowledge rapidly if you were outside of an elite, accepted, authorial culture. And that gives me some hope, and I'd like to end on that note. Patients are not going to be patient any longer. Derek, can I add something quick? Of course. Mm -hmm. So Catherine was my professor at medical school. Second day of orientation week. So imagine how lucky I was then to mm. be able to listen to that. Uh, but like a full circle moment right now. But literally, I think it's important that we are not just all these people. We come from a community and we come from other people, right? Um, and I hope that this commission, in terms of the vision you were talking to, can also pass the baton, can also bring community to others as well. Um, and I just thought I'd, I'd have to say that because, yeah. I wasn't sophisticated then in all this language. <laughs> and she affirmed my experiences of a racist South Africa and what was happening to my body, but also the bodies of my people as well. Um, and I think that was really, um, yeah, incredible. Thank you. So I should say, um, we're going to be taking questions in just a minute. Um, I do want to make sure that those online put questions in the chat. And so we do need to, that. Uh, for those of you here in person, uh, we will be taking fielding questions he from here in person as well. Um, but before we do that, I do have one more question, or at least just one more thought and prompt. Um, so there is quite a bit of research on racism in health, as you've seen but from some of the folks. And you've referenced Dr. Jones. Um, you, of course, heard from the eminent Dr. Williams. Not that the first Dr. Jones is not eminent. She's very eminent, so let me not get in trouble for that. But there's quite a bit of research that we've seen. Um, what is the relationship between racism and global health that you see this commission being uniquely positioned to fill? Or that you hope it will fill, given your particular areas of expertise and lenses that you bring to the table? Truth truth um, and I think truth by people who are not removed from the very issues that we are trying to deal with and I think there's a very personal story but a very personal commitment to making sure um, that the commission succeeds and the idea of community for me is very important and that's why even in the the last year of our commission is actually dedicated to this dis dissemination, but also closing the loop, because we also realize that knowledge production requires other people. And we will be asking people to tell very difficult stories that they perhaps have been telling over and over again. Yeah. And it's important for me and all of us as in, the, in the commission to go back to people and say, this is what your knowledge has been able to do. This is what affirmation looks like because often racism makes you think that you are the responsible for your own failing. And sometimes it's to know that actually I'm not the only one. My community is not the only one and that you know there are other people who are grappling the same. But it's also about sharing, sharing knowledge, sharing and, and uplifting voices and giving space to voices that are often not seen as experts who don't meet academic snobbery. Um, and it's about affirming those people as well and going back to them and respecting their time and the fact that this is difficult for them as well um, as partners, as people who will be co-conspirators with us in this process. And I think for me, a commitment to truth is very, very important. 
Yeah. Okay, you're all looking at me. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a predetermined order. Um, for, for me, it's about the, it's the lines of knowledge and it's the effects and impacts of decision making. And when you look at issues, especially from a financial perspective, one doesn't necessarily see the discrimination or the racism in that whole process. And for me, that is probably the most important evidence-based uh, discussion or conversation I want to see um, highlighted. Because if I give an example of a decision made in a global body on even uh, where vaccines are going or whether or not we are targeting a particular disease or another one. And then you come down into a continental level and suddenly it seems to be a dynamic that has different kinds of economic repercussions. It's about allowing entry of other peoples into the spaces. Um, I always say, and uh, my gosh, but we're online. I always say in <laughs> class, I always say in class that um, Africa and Asia should thank God for the malaria mosquito because colonization in different parts of the world took place in very different ways. And in some parts of the world today, there are very few indigenous people. I've really sanitized what I normally say. <laughs> uh, but it's the reality on the ground. It's, these are the effects. And here is health and the failure to find a cure being something actually in a way that you can flip on its head and make it positive. But it's that, it's those lines of decision making and it's the effect of the system at the end of the day. And then it's who gets to survive. Oh, very good points. And, yeah. May I? Carl, I know we're going out of the order from before, Chandra. You know, we've been talking about the murder of an individual by a group of police and how that moved around the world. And I think we heard the editor of The Lancet saying that was a global break moment. I'd like to share another one that I think relates to your question. When a very, very famous, um, probably the best living athlete in the world in her career, um, a tennis player called Serena Williams, um, gave birth in a private health institution in the United States. And in the aftermath of giving birth to her daughter, nearly died and was hemorrhaging and in tremendous pain and was trying to communicate with the health uh, officials uh, around her what she understood herself to be going through. And from what I've read from her own words, published in the New York Times, and also the people that she has communicated with subsequently who've published their work, um, including uh, Professor Washington, who has written a, a powerful book about apartheid and health in the US. Um, she, she understood that people were not listening to her and attending to her for no other good reason than she was considered to be a powerful pain uh, warrior and a person of African descent and therefore uh, un, unable to understand that medical professionals had her condition under control. And she was being hysterical. All around the world, people read and heard of that story. She is an extremely well-known personality on the African continent. She has traveled all over the African continent to promote tennis and women in sport. And I think that we need to understand the impact of her birth narrative. Because all over the African continent and in the country I live, people say, do you see? You see this understanding of pain you see this understanding of what a body is in labor. Here is one of the greatest human physical forms performing unbelievable feats in the theater of tennis. And she is about to lose her life in the last gasp, but the most highly trained medical professionals in the world will not listen to her. You see? This is what we are going through. Now, this story of her birth narrative would never have traveled the world so quickly 50 years ago, or it would have been controlled by particular dominant forces.
but this energized young nurse, nurses trainees, young doctors in training all over the continent that I live on. And I see it was shared across the globe. So at the one hand, this is a diagnosis of the problem. On the other hand, this is also a recipe for hope because that story moves and mobilizes and creates a kind of Velcro effect with other forms of evidence. And that's, for me, a baton pass about where we're going and how we can try and analyze using the voices of ordinary people and also combing the digital archive for evidence. You. Um, yeah, so to um, very much compliment what Professor Burns just said, I think this commission, you know, the re when you asked the question about the relationship, you know, between in terms of racism and global health, one thing that this commission can uh, really fulfill is very well placed to engage with um, can be summed up in the word blind spots. You know, when Dr. Mufokeng said truth, uh, I would also add the, in, in very closely related to that, the blind spots in, in terms of healthcare provisioning. Uh, there are certain realities that people kind of take for granted. You know, um, we've had this discussion since the beginning of this event today, um, how racism, the word racism is understood, you know, as a problem in the United States or as a problem in South Africa, whereas um, uh, racial discrimination, uh, racially motivated forms of discrimination uh, are universal, have different manifestations in different parts of the world. So um, in the uh, world region that I come from, South Asia, for instance, in the Indian subcontinent, um, serious, serious forms of uh, racial discrimination that adversely target um, uh, people from uh, caste backgrounds in the lower echelons of the of the caste ladder, for instance, serious levels of um, um, healthcare-related violence, gynecological violence that specifically target um, Dalit women, for instance. So the hashtag is Jaya Beam uh, for, for, the just, for justice for Dalit communities. So th there is a body of work that this commission can fulfill in terms of uh, uh, zooming in on these um, on these gaps, these misconceptions, and then there is a body of specialist knowledge that this commission can also shed light on, zoom in on, prioritize. Because um, I mean, in the in the in the in the in the sector of healthcare, um, in many countries, there is this. Um, uh, tendency to not go into the specifics. Uh, so when we think in terms of uh, uh, healthcare services for uh, non-heteronormative, non-cisnormative people, for instance, uh, very few um, healthcare bodies are inclined to mm. kind of engage in a serious reflection on the fact that when you say intersex uh, people's uh, healthcare for intersex peoples or people with uh, uh, intersex variations, that's a specific body of healthcare that requires specific specific spe specialist knowledge. And when you say trans healthcare, it's, it's another body of healthcare that requires specific knowledge and uh, focus on the well-being of the individuals concerned, right? But that's not the way in which many healthcare systems work and those disparities this commission can shed light upon. My final point here is that, most importantly, this commission is, I would say, very well pleased to engage in a conversation about what I would call um, intersectional injustices in the the sector of healthcare provisioning. So when you say intersectional justice, you're talking about um, economic, socioeconomic injustices. You're talking about um, serious disparities when it comes to gender-based injustices uh, across the uh, healthcare systems uh, in the world, uh, in uh, which have different manifestations from you know Turtle Island to Aotearoa and other places, and um, so the the intersectional injustices in terms of healthcare provision, which you know obviously have a very strong uh, gender politics uh, uh, dimension. I think this commission is very well placed to address those. And one last final point is that. Addressing those intersectional injustices means really saving lives and 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 um, and saving the next generation. Just the other day, uh, in the uh, House of Parliament in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the co-leader of the Maori Party made a, s a speech about how 
Maori babies are being um, uh, targeted uh, and 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 ill treated in the foster care system. Which I mean, the, there's a ministry, Ministry of Children, Oranga Tamariki, which uh, is which was historically created to basically um, in the same way as in residential schools in, in Turtle Island to distance the Maori children and babies from their cultural, uh, social, cultural environments and their intimate family surroundings and to make them and to assimilate them. So these assimilationist policies are not things of yesteryear. They are things that are really happening now. Um, the residential school system in what we know as Canada may have ended, but the system persists in the foster care system, right? So those are serious, uh, you know, uh, examples of serious intersectional injustices in the sector of, you know, healthcare that uh, that affect the family, you know, politics of the family uh, policy, public policy in relation to, you know, uh, family rights, public policy in relation to the rights of the child, and so on and so forth. These are things that this commission is very well pleased to critically engage in and zoom in on. Oh. So thank you. Let me actually first, if we don't mind, just say thank you to the panel before we open it up for questions. Thank you. And we do have, a, we'll just again, re-encourage those who are online to uh, put more questions in the chat. But we already have a couple. So let me start with um, the first. I think that actually picks up nicely on, the, on particularly the last two comments. How can the general public engage with the work of the commission? Well. <laughs> So we have a work plan um, in place, and some of the activities, like I said, we're really op aiming for an open process. So we have commissioners basically covering a large area of the globe, and what we aim to do is use them and their work that's rooted in those spaces to be able to reach particular communities and focus on a subthematic working area. Um, we're starting to think broadly around issues of planetary health, for example, and how to locate a racial justice lens within those discussions around climate change. Um, we are also going to have um, site visits that are also very important as a fact-finding mission. We are also going to have a series of webinars and talks. Uh, today is the launch one, but it's not the last. And we aim to have people who have particular experiences, particular expertise, even new emerging research. I mean, I think most of us on this uh, uh, panel are engaged in academia in some way. And one of the most important things for us is to support directly some of that work, but also to inspire mm -hmm. some of research questions and the way research is framed, for example. So we have a Twitter account, we have Instagram, uh, we have an email that we can also share. Um, the Secretariat, of course, being Ed O'Neill, will kind of help synthesize in different thematic areas, you know, the, the kind of reach, outreach that we are getting, but very happy to, to support and be involved in other initiatives as well. We are, like I said in the beginning, committed to learning, but also unlearning. Mm -hmm. And there may be spaces that as a commission, as commissioners, as co-chairs, we are there to listen and to learn. And uh, we are quite happy for the public, and I'm not sure we are also the public, I mean, you know, uh, we are happy to collaborate with colleagues. I always like to use more of that collaborative language. There's no public and then us. Like, yeah. we are also the public. We're just trying to come together to do something in a moment in time through the commission. But absolutely welcome um, all of the work, the research, the evidence, the stories. I, I, I love storytelling. Um, I think there's so much power in in reclaiming you know for yourself um your own personal truth so yeah we'll be involved um very academically but also all the way down um to fireside chat in communities yeah do you want to give the the accounts i don't know if this is too dangerous but do you want to give the twitter account and the the other if, if you have can we can we'll get it we'll get it if you don't have it off put in the chat but yes we'll um, find it it's um so next question oh any other any other thoughts um before i move on to the next question we agree with our chair. Okay. <laughs> Just one thing. Please. Again, maybe it sounds strange that a historian is talking about technologies of the future, but um, we're learning a lot as historians at the moment about uh, digital.
processing archives and how this radically opens up their interpretation to a much bigger group of people. And so it would be really wonderful if there was a way for us to create with our um, outstanding professional colleagues at O'Neill and other places uh, a kind of a site, a sort of um, folder in the web where people can be feel free to place their forms of evidence in a shared, maybe even a radical, almost kind of a wiki. So that obviously these would be checked and verified and triangulated with other evidence. But there is so much work that people have done in the world that hasn't ended up getting through the narrow pipe of journals. And it would be really wonderful if there could be a kind of commons created where people could share useful evidence that would promote this work. Um, and, and they would retain ownership of it, but it could be referred to. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a partner, one of our partners, um, I won't say who yet, but that's exactly what they're looking um, at providing us, unlimited cloud space um, to be able to do this kind of work. Um, yeah. So thank you. So the next question, well, before I take questions, I want to make sure I also take questions from the, the audience in person here. But let me ask one more from the, from the online audience. So the, the next question was, can the panelists give some insight into the changes they'd make to the global health architecture, what types of institutions, and with what channels? Oh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Professor Catherine Burns has trained <laughs> the co-chair, so maybe that's one way. <laughs> there, there, there is a movement globally that our colleagues in places like Kenya and India are really pushing. And that is for a kind of health and medical humanities, a sort of sub-discipline. And it, it sits in a complicated relationship to global health. Mm -hmm. So they're not collapsible into each other. And it's, um, it's very interesting to see how the southern hemisphere of the world and countries, for example, in Eastern Europe, are taking the lead. I'm not saying that the United States or Canada don't have medical and health humanities types of programs. They do. But um, some of the best work globally is, is coming from another space. Um, recently, um, a professor at Wits University called Professor Shilam Bembe, who's a very widely read commentator and uh, uh, American and French educated Cameroonian born scholar, has been talking about these shifting forms of, of knowledge. So I think that in some of the clinical disciplines, which are also, of course, central to our discussion of health, there is a sea change, and the fulcrum is moving possibly away from some northern spaces. And in, even in places like Edinburgh, which produced uh, four or five generations of medical experts that went uh, through these global channels across the world, um, there is a, a new humility, I think, and a recognition of knowledge Center. So that is beginning to happen. It will take a long time, but I didn't th think I'd see that in my lifetime 20 years ago. Um, any other? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, there's, there's been um, a lot of discussions, at least in the spaces I'm in, around uh, the financing of rights. And towards the end of uh, 2012, before the end of the Millennium Development Goals, uh, myself and a group of my colleagues, we actually did an analysis of tax data, revenue data on the African continent. And the, we did a correlation with the MDG targets. And what was fascinating was the reason we were able to do it was because 2010, 2011 was actually the first year African countries release taxpayer data. So, you know, when you talk about data and, it, you know, how do you do an analysis if, if you cannot access the information? And the, the outcome of that research was fascinating because we could see a direct correlation between the ability of states to actually collect revenue and then their commitment to spending. So the more they were collecting, the more likely they were to actually spend on the MDGs. But the other sort of 
hole in the information that came out was that it didn't matter if an, a particular African country had natural resources because you couldn't see spending increasing because of the pot of revenue. You only saw the correlation with tax, which, which brought a lot of question marks, not just about, and because we're talking financing generally, is not only about whether taxpayers are actually demanding or asking for uh, things to be spent on what their, their priorities, but also this big hole on uh, as almost a black hole in trying to understand uh, other types of government revenue, so debts, uh, loans, grants in aid, uh, government business, and then of course natural resources. And where is all of that sort of revenue going in? And that actually takes me to the, the other area I like working on, which is illicit financial flows and that whole structured system that has been there for so long, but has developed actually just after the end of colonization. Mm. So it's very interesting that it came in almost as a, a replacement factor. And we use it a lot as terms of um, economic colonization and that whole conversation that's there. But there's a lot of publications coming out of the African continent around the interconnections between um, rights and resources and then specifically health is a huge uh, batch. Happy to share later. Yes, please. Um, first of all, wait, hold on. There's a mic coming. Hi, the name. Great. My name is Oli Nkafigbai with GHIC, and I just want to thank the panelists and everybody who's put this together. It's been great to listen to the line of discussion between hope and struggle privilege and people in kind of states of uh, disempowerment and indignity. And I guess I wanted to localize my question because there's been a lot of talk about the aspirations of the commission and localize that question in the global health practitioner at a very practical level for all of us who kind of work within the ecosystem. And to ask of the panelists what mindset shift you would hope for global health practitioners, what thing you would want for global health practitioners to learn or unlearn as kind of individual actors as we think about racism and structural discrimination. Thank you. Yeah, so I think I had this frustration as a medical student because I knew that what I was, I was being taught on a clinical level, the skills, take a history examination, that was okay and you know, that's fine. But I felt that there was also things missing that I wasn't being told. And so I would interrogate, for example, the history of gynecology and read up about how particular types of stitches right, were practiced on slave women multiple times to refine the surgery. And so I, I was a medical student having, lit I'm actually getting goosebumps now, mm. having literal crisis moments in my tutorials, in my training, knowing what we are being taught was practice on slave women. Um, but one of the ways is to show how racism is bad for everybody. So the history of gynecology is what it was, but it's all women. If you need an IUD, they say, oh, it's just like a bad period cramp. No, it's not like it's just a bad period cramp. You need analgesia and you need preparation, right? But you'll find that procedures um, that are done on people assigned male at birth, medical insurance will cover it, you get a day off work, you get analgesia, and no one even stops to say, oh, just be strong. You'll just, you, you know, it's like just, oh, just have a baby. Your, maybe your fibroids and your endometriosis will get better. So it's about interrogating the systems we inherited. And I, there was a lot of discomfort in me that I had to honor and be like, I know what I'm being taught, but I also have to pass. So I realized that I was not in a position to overly question what I was being taught and how I was being taught. So I kind of had to wait to get my own independence as a young doctor and then really start changing even the way that I practice medicine, which is why I actually couldn't specialize in gynecology and obstetrics, by the way. It's just, it's, it's, it's just too, it's a lot. And I think for me, once I saw what I saw and heard what I heard, I couldn't unsee it and unhear it. And so I have a very difficult relationship. I couldn't. I couldn't. Um, but I think the medical curriculum is the very first step and it's an immediate thing. This we can do tomorrow. If the heads of Dean of Health Sciences found this important enough, they would change the curriculum. They would absolutely teach human rights. They would think about the types of questions and the things we are meant to ask 
patients who should, didn't be patients, right? Just even the way we term it, mm. we were already decided on the power dynamics mm. in that consultation room. So yeah, it's important, um, I think, that that question, but I think the medical curriculum itself has to radically change. We are still producing doctors and nurses who themselves, um, because of education, being a doctor, because of what that power means, um, don't want to interrogate what they inherited as, the, as medicine, as a, as a science. And I think mm -hmm. there's a lot there that isn't okay. And unless we are willing to face the truth, we can then, at the end of graduation, just miraculously have doctors and nurses who understand um, all of these important concepts. So the, the training itself and the curriculum in, 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 in the space has to change. And yeah, I mean, and who gets to be called an expert in global health? It's another discussion altogether, <laughs> but <laughs> yes. Sorry, I had a whiplash moment. Everyone <laughs> always, I, I, wherever I go, everyone says, oh, there's the African expert. And I'm thinking, no, UN, special rapporteur, yeah. kind of global, but okay. But um, I, for me, it's the trade-off. It's, I want people to know the trade-off. Uh, what the cost was of it, what the opportunity cost was of it. I didn't use the money in my country on this. My leadership <coughs> didn't use it on this, but they used it on I that. So when you're making that um, decision on how things are being done, that it is conscious. So for me, it's, it's about the knowledge being very, very powerful. And then, of course, you, you cannot control the decision the person is going to make in the end anyway. But let nobody say that they made it in ignorance. Oh. We have about, we have only about three minutes. We'll take this last question and then, and then wrap up. Thank you. My name is Giza Dang. I'm here from Matahari Global Solutions and Treatment Action Group. And I'm kind of leaning on this last question, but also on the experience that you've talked about. And, you know, the idea of bringing in the truth from lived experience and knowledge from other places. But as you well said, rights need resources. And so how do you, what role do you think the commission can play in moving philanthropy um, and other uh, financial givers towards financing more community participation, both in this commission, but in global health more broadly, in particular in the face of a lot of these institutions being you know, white supremacy systems and governed uh, by those that represent white supremacy. Thank you. I want Shamindra to have a comment before the three minutes end, but that just reminds me of the um, work and advocacy of civil society. In South Africa, when the government was denying HIV in the one hand, doctors and nurses were doing amazing work on the ground, and so were the researchers. There was like this political disconnect, and it took the work of civil society. Again, truth-telling and mobilizing. And I think we need to get to a point where in global health, we do the same with funders, finances, philanthropies. Who sets the agenda? Who decides on the targets? Um, who decided that was urgent in any case for that particular community? And again, I think it will take continuous effort um, on, 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 on again, and I don't wanna you know, overburden civil society, but we know that things have moved and we have to be honest in global health, that the, those in power are not really as powerful as they think they are. They don't move much. It's civil society, and that's why we have to defend the space of civil society to do what they need to do, both within the UN, outside of the UN, in all of these structures. And because they are the ones, again, who are living the daily compounded uh, effects of all of these structural discrimination. So I think for me, part of the answer is that there has to be a demand that says to philanthropists, to finances, you can't hide anyway. There's no way for you to hide. And we demand that this happens. And it ties in with some of the work that you do, that so many African countries, Southeast Asia, Latin America, they are so indebted, right? And the conditions of their p debt prepayments make it impossible for those countries to actually put their own GDP and their own fiscus to support health programming, which gets us into that vicious cycle of depending on global health aid. 
and what gets decided in one country's Supreme Court directly impacts foreign policy and what kind of aid happens in another different part of the world. And it's about talking about those injustices, but really defending with everything that we have the right of civil society to be participating at all levels of global health. COVID is a clear example. That lack of transparency, the secrecy around the negotiations, the pricing. Where was civil society in the room? I mean, you would have thought that the, the, the wins that the HIV um, sector did would have taught everyone in global health and in these institutions that actually they need civil society to say the things that perhaps they can't say. We know these things they can't say, but then get the people in the room who can say them. So if you shut them out as well, you know. So I think for me the key to some of your questions is civil society participation and demanding and showing that there is no place to hide but to talk about the elephant in the room, which is racism, which is structural discrimination, and that the commission itself will be interrogating. Many of our own partners <laughs> have a history of colonialism and coloniality. So we're we, we, we very clear um, on, 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 on that, you know, um, and it's important to, for us to move, to move forward. Shamindra, I've spoken to. <laughs> <laughs> Very grand. Uh, so yes, uh, the um, one one uh, comment about the global health practitioner, the previous question. Um, I mean, you said it, the key word, unlearning. Uh, global health practitioners, uh, uh, in, in many cases, um, have a serious, I mean, this the focus on unlearning is, is crucial, is critical, um, because they, uh, established ways of doing things uh, has this um, th th there is this understanding that you can come up with um, a body of knowledge uh, that you think is um, one that corresponds to the specific needs of uh, an individual or of a community or of a group of people without centering the centering on that particular demographic or that group of people or that individual and trying to figure out what exactly works for people. You know, that's why uh, there's been so much violence against um, intersex people and it's intersex babies. This is why there is so much misunderstanding uh, in this country and elsewhere when it comes to trans healthcare, you, because you don't talk to trans people, you don't talk to trans children and you you, you uh, engage in a form of, um, uh, Dr. Mofoke explained this very well in the, in, uh, the United Nations yesterday, uh, a form of epistemic violence, you know, where depending on who you are, depending on where you come from, the knowledge base that you bring to the table or the knowledge of lived experience that you bring to the table is disregarded. You know, In in my book, Decolonizing Peacebuilding, I put a poem at the very beginning by Grada Quilomba, the Portuguese artist, where she says, when um, when we say it, it's it's just trivia, or it's not important, it's just uh, uh, um, some kind of banality, but when they say it, as such, you know, those with power, those with better access aid, uh, it's uh, it's knowledge, it's uh, it's empirical insight. So this kind of uh, epistemic violence need to be addressed, and then um, uh, I'm, I'm, like that's the that's the way in which this commission can positively influence uh, and positively impact the global health practitioner. And the question about you know philanthropy and that. The um, key point there would be sustainability, because um, uh, l in many cases, um, philanthropic funding uh, seems to um, adopt policies that still, like when it comes to um, uh, the, the, the philanthropic funding landscape for uh, LGBTQI plus human rights, for instance, um, there is still this reluctance to 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 uh, counterintuitively take into account what really works for people, you know, and and what really um, what are the real real needs, and how do you align your your grant making priorities with those uh, specific needs requirements uh, that that people that specific demographics uh, have. So. In terms of strengthening the sustainability of, of philanthropic funding and you know funded projects and initiatives, uh, there is a need to think critically of sustainability. You know how how is it? You know this this grant making initiative. How is it going to actively proactively impact people's lives? And how is it going to ensure sustainability? You know so that people can move to the next level. You know without moving around a circle. You know uh, and and 
uh, on on such matters you know that's where this commission can seriously come in and i think this commission has a, has a very important uh, dialogue if not series of dialogues to engage in with the with our partners and uh, friends and colleagues in uh, in the in the sector of global philanthropic funding thank you um i think we're over time or at time so we need to close um, just to say that we will send contact information on how people can get in contact with the commission after the event. And let's say thank you again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Griffiths, and this esteemed panel. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. There's so much to say, but I just want us to have a few minutes of reflections from Anil Soni, the CEO of the World Health, Found World Health Organization Foundation. Thank you, Ngozi. Um, Ngozi and Talang invited me to share some reflections because of a, a role that I was truly honored to play to help conceive and incubate this commission over the last 18 months, and I'm in deep awe of the 10 people we've heard from over the last two hours. Um, I'm also feeling quite humbled by the people we're here to serve, um, including Chiminda, the indigenous person who you told us about who lost her life and who live streamed her experience. It's those individuals that we're here to serve. I want to share with you a personal reflection and then perhaps Ngozi and, and Talang, a final moment of passing the baton uh, in terms of the work of the commission. In terms of the, the personal reflection, I will share with you there's a degree to which this commission exists because of my own awareness of complicity. I've been working in global health for 25 years. Much of that time, I thought I've been working to improve equality of access to health care. But I was complicit as I learned uh, as a consumer in some of the choices I make that contribute to mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex in the United States. I was complicit, I learned, when I was the chief executive of a nonprofit that hired dozens of people in Kenya, and it turns out they were all Kikuyu, and we weren't recognizing the degree to which we were discriminatory in our own practice. I was complicit in the degree to which, as a member of a constructed Kshatriya caste, I would go home and visit family and be served by individuals who were in very different positions as a consequence of the constructed caste they were in. I was complicit in that I was a founding executive of the Global Fund, but I didn't know 20 years ago when we created that organization that we needed to ask for coverage of health interventions to be measured against the identity of people when they are in groups that are oppressed, because in the absence of knowing that, those billions of dollars could be reinforcing discrimination and oppression as opposed to working against it. We are all complicit because these systems are so pervasive. But it was from that place of personal discomfort that I was empowered because I realize just as I have contributed to these systems, I can help change them. And that was the moment in my life when I came to understand what it meant to not simply be non-racist in my personal be beliefs and behaviors, or at least my conscious beliefs and behaviors, but what it meant to be an anti-racist and someone who could be an ally. That was the fertile soil coming back and goes to your metaphor earlier in which I started thinking about the need for this commission and, and had the opportunity to meet Talang and Ngozi and many others. And I'm so grateful to everyone who's brought the commission to this point to its day one. A few reflections as I was asked to, to give in terms of the work of the commission. And I'm saying things that have already been said in the last two hours, but I think they warrant saying them again and again and again until they're heard and until we act on them. Structural discrimination and racism and the impact and the ways we see that impact in health, it's bad. It's bad and it hasn't gotten better despite all of the billions of dollars and all of the efforts and all of the rhetoric. The, Professor Williams earlier talked to us about 40 years later, the income gap between black Americans and white Americans being exactly what it was. The wealth gap's even worse. 
Kumanan, who spoke to us from the WHO, told me, and this was striking to me, that in New Zealand, despite a lot of progressive legislation around improving the health disparities between the Maori and the non-Maori people, nothing's worked. We had, David and I had a conversation last night in which we were talking about what does work. The evidence actually isn't clear. So it's in, we're, the starting point for the commission is it's bad. It's gotten worse. It hasn't gotten better despite everything that's been done. Secondly, these systems are intentional. My wife, who I adore and who's a professor and who teaches me about this because she's a professor of social policy and child welfare here in New York, she helps me understand that the systems we're talking about were made to do exactly what they're doing. This is not a flaw in the design. It is the design. And these are systems that were created and perpetuated over hundreds of years. Systems that exploited some people for the economic betterment of others, and whether that was on the basis of gender or race or other constructed ways in which we judge some humans versus others, those systems were intentional. And the legacy of those systems we continue to live with. So one, it's bad and it hasn't gotten better, and two, these systems are intentional. And because we're inheriting the legacy of hundreds of years of oppression and systemic oppression, it takes a lot to turn the tanker the other way. Third, all of these systems are connected. And that's something I've been appreciating in a lot of the discussion today and also trying to be a student of. The ideologies and systems of oppression, again, it doesn't matter who the racialized or who the other group is, when all of those others see that, in fact, that together they are the majority, then we can do something differently. So all of these systems of discrimination are connected. And I think there are people in this room, and the commission will use this term racism, to describe something that we actually don't have a word for. Though There is a great book called Cast, which tries to create some language about this over the last few years, to describe the fact that, in fact, this is a single, a single phenomenon not lots of different phenomenons that have to operate only separately. It's bad, it hasn't gotten better, it's intentional, it's connected. At five, at five, five so a fourth and a fifth, and then, I'll, and then I'll share some thoughts on what I hope for from the commission. Fourth, the current response is inadequate by the global health community. And I say this for whatever that means as a global health practitioner. Um, I don't know that I'm an expert on anything, but I'm in a position of power. And I wanna use that to acknowledge that our current response is inadequate that we have agencies who talk about this in a performative way, but don't fundamentally turn the lens inward and ask how do we need to reform our agencies to live up to our rhetoric? I think the current response is inadequate. And lastly, why health? I believe that global health manifests the impact of discrimination and can be a platform for power. Health has the attention of the G7 because of the pandemic that we're still in, but emerging from, I think health, if we see global health as not a passive recipient of the effects of these systems, but instead, if we can identify how global health stakeholders can assert what needs to change, that global health can actually have an impact on the sectors outside of health, which manifest health inequity. So we can be the bellwether and also the platform for power to drive changes in discrimination and structural discrimination, uh, racism and structural discrimination outside of the health sector. So those are a few reflections for me as I was asked to share. In terms of what I hope for for the commission, I'm so excited about what you're doing. I'm so deeply grateful, and I don't know that it's public yet, all of the confirmed commissioners, but oh my gosh. I mean, you are a powerful group of individuals, and what I hope for from you if I can be so bold, what I invite is that you shine a bright, burning light that we cannot turn our eyes away from on the existing and new data to make clear the size of the impact of structural discrimination and racism on health. That if we want to achieve health equity, that has to be at the top of our priority list. That's one. Secondly, that you can identify solutions and a research agenda to propose change so that you can guide us not just from acknowledging the problem, but to moving towards meaningful solutions. And third, please hold this community accountable. 
please give recommendations to the global health community, broad ones, ambitious ones, but also very specific points. Say, Global Fund, you need to do this. WHO, you need to do this. UNAIDS, here's a specific policy or practice that you can implement tomorrow if you believe in what we're doing. And then dare us not to do it. In three years, I can't wait for you to speak to us, any of us in global health, and say, do the following, and you'll be, move, you'll be making a material, meaningful difference, and then we will do it. And I certainly can't wait to be part of the group that supports you in doing that work and ensuring that that work leads to meaningful outcomes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anil. Um, what a charge, what a charge. I um, can feel the weight of that responsibility and the excitement for it as well, so thank you. And I know we're a bit over, so please permit me three more minutes. Before I give my closing remarks, I want to thank all of you for joining in person and online. And thank you to all the speakers for being honest, vulnerable, raw, and challenging in your remarks. And thank you to O'Neill Institute, um, the Secretariat, and I think they all deserve a shout out. So <laughs> thank you, Olo, Sarah, Nikki, Bethany, Carla, Matt, and Katie. We could not have done any of this without you, and we're excited to continue this journey together. And thank you to the amazing Ford staff and Sally Booker. So my closing. Racism is huge. Structural discrimination is a massive topic. And as Anil said, it's bad and it's intentional. It's not just for one commission to tackle, and we know that that's not the expectation. We know that we stand on the shoulders of giants, and we desire to walk alongside initiatives, groups, students, and other communities that are ready and willing to dismantle racism. And to see a new order when it comes to indigenous knowledge, racial equity, and white supremacy narratives that are all part of all of our cultures. Like Assistant Secretary Lois said, the process is as important as the outcomes, and so we're going to be serious about this process. We invite you all to be with us. We're together. Tlaleng and I are honored to lead this work, and we ask you to please stay with us throughout this journey. And we look forward to engaging with you through consultations in the first year and the grounding, translation, and dissemination of findings beyond that. Help us to shine brightly together. And with that, goodbye for now. Thanks. Thanks.